Hey, it's Emily Williams, the founder of I Heart My Life and your host of the I Heart My Life show. This is episode 93, how a former lawyer built a $500,000 coaching business in five years with Anna Powers. So today's episode is really special to me. I'm reconnecting with one of my former clients, Sarah Anna Powers, to share her story of going from a lawyer who was dedicated to law but realized she was meant for something more to creating an incredible, thriving coaching and copywriting business. So Anna had a lot of trepidation around moving forward with her own business, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of questions around, will this actually work for me or should I stay with my safe, in air quotes, (laughs) job as a lawyer? And so if you're questioning a career change and wondering if moving forward with your own business is the right next step for you, this is the perfect episode for you to listen to. Anna talks about how she got clear on whether working with me in particular was the right next step, how she moved past her fear of spending money and investing in her dreams, and how she ultimately was able to serve and impact the world in a way that she'd always wanted to do. So today's episode is incredibly inspiring. It's also very action-based. So Anna's going to give you some step-by-step processes and things to think about as you move forward with your own business. So let's go ahead and dive in. This episode is sponsored by iHeart Coaching, our signature program for new and aspiring online coaches. iHeart Coaching is your one-stop shop designed to support you in becoming the next standout online coach. Whether you're brand new to the digital space or looking to take your coaching business to the next level, this is a comprehensive program that's going to show you how to build a successful coaching business from A to Z. We're going to share how to generate maximum revenue and book out your calendar with dream clients. To learn more, go to iHeartCoaching.com. Welcome to the show, Anna. I'm super excited to have this time with you. It's been a while since we properly caught up. So welcome. Thank you so much, Emily. I am so excited to be here. You always make me smile. So I know we're going to have a good conversation and inspire a lot of people today. So I just appreciate you taking the time. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait to catch up and just I'm super grateful for the opportunity because I know that you have been such an amazing inspiration in my life. So it feels like such a cool full circle moment to be able to be on the show and hopefully give some encouragement to your listeners. Thank you. Yes, you definitely will. And with that, I always like to start with the story behind the success. And I know you have a really juicy story with lots of different key elements, some twists and twists and turns, some moments of doubt and fear that you've moved through. So can you take us back and tell us where it all began? Yeah. So from the time that I was, I don't know, eight or nine years old and saw Claire Huxtable on the Cosby show, uh, for any of your listeners who remember that show, I wanted to be a lawyer. And Claire Huxtable on that show was a lawyer and she looked like she just had the best life. So my whole life, you know, I planned on being a lawyer, went to law school, graduated law school in 2009, right in the middle of the, the last recession, got a great job right out of school, even in the middle of a recession, making almost 100K. And I mean, that first year, Emily, I knew this is really not the career for me. But then it's this awkward moment where you realize, whoa, I've planned for this my whole life. I've gone to school for seven years. I actually am licensed in both Mississippi and Tennessee. So I've taken multiple bar exams. And now I'm in this career that I can tell is not a good fit for me. But I thought, you know, I got to I gotta stick with it. I mean, what else am I going to do at this point? I'm not going to like go back and try to find a whole new career. And so I practiced law and I got into my fifth year of practice. And by that time, I was making less money because uh, I had switched firms. I was making less money than I was making my first year out of law school. And I was working harder and more hours. <laughs> and I thought, we are going the wrong direction here. And so I um, applied to get a coach and really thought that this person was going to be a career coach who would just help me take my skills that I had in law and kind of repurpose them and find a better J-O-B that was a fit for me. And so I had this discovery call with this coach and she basically said, huh, you have a really interesting story. Why, Why don't you think about helping others as a coach? 
And the interesting story she was referring to was my history of overcoming both anorexia and binge eating. And so she said, you know, you could go get a health coaching certification and you could help people as a health coach. And Emily, I knew in my gut immediately, like, that's not really where I want to spend my working hours. Like that's a passion that I have is, you know, making sure that women know that they're valuable no matter what their body looks like. But that really wasn't where I wanted to build a business. But I thought, well, she's a coach. And so she knows better than I do. So I'll just do what she says. And so I built this health coaching business on the side while I was practicing law. And I worked in that business for almost two years and made $2,150 total. Totally. Let me just interrupt you really quick. Like, I love this story. And I'm just curious to know, like, there were a few different moments where you said the first year of law school, you felt like something was off this time when she shared information about what it looked like to be a health coach, you felt like that was off. So what was it that was feeling off about those scenarios? So law school felt okay. It was my first year of the practice of law that felt so unaligned or misaligned, however you would say it. (laughs) And what felt so off about that was that I love people. I am an extrovert. I'm genuinely interested in um, people and their stories. I love connecting with people in person or virtually um, and travel a lot and have lived in Europe. And so when I started practicing law, I was really hired to be a researcher writer. And what that looked like practically um, was me sitting in an office with the door closed for 12 hours a day. Maybe every three days, I might have a phone conversation with someone for 10 minutes, but it was pretty much me alone. And then, you know, I was living alone with my cat. And so I literally spend all day, yes, in an office, but alone go home, be alone. And for an extrovert who loves people, it was just a terrible fit. Um, with the health coach, uh, she the, the gal that I signed up with was a business coach. But when she was pushing me toward health coaching, uh, I think what didn't feel like a fit there was that just felt like a passion, not... Um, It felt like a passion, not somewhere that I wanted to build a business. What I desired to do business-wise was something along the lines of leadership coaching, business building coaching. But I had this limiting belief that because I haven't built a business, um, and I had this marker in my mind, like you can't be a business coach unless you built at least a six-figure business. And that was just what I believed. Um, And... So I knew that I had the experience and could get the the certification to do the health coaching, but it just felt like fitting a square peg in a round hole. Right. And then, so you tried that for a couple of years, Mm -hmm. you made your $2,100. Is that what you said? 2150, Emily. Okay. That's important. (laughs) And what was it? Like, I remember, and maybe this is a different part of the story, but I remember you coming to me maybe around that time, you can tell us, and you were frustrated because you're like, is this ever going to happen for me? I've been putting in the hours. It's been two years. Can I even do coaching? Can I even have my own business? Was that around that same time? Yeah. So I started my very first coach I hired in the fall of 2014. Um, My business officially started in in 2015. The LLC was formed. And I actually, the first thing I did with you was your 90 days to 6K. And I think I signed up in the summer of 2015. So it was, um, but it was just a self-study. And then I enrolled in iHeart Coaching in the spring of 2016. And that's when, you know, we started connecting on on a more personal level. and and, And I was like, look, I've been building this for more than a year. And I've spent the money and hired the coaches. And I've done all the things they told me to do. And I don't understand why it's not working. And I would look around at these other people who had these successful businesses. And I would think, I know I'm as smart as they are. And I know I'm definitely as hard a worker as they are. I I don't get why it's not happening. And the piece was truly the alignment. And it was me giving myself permission to do what I really wanted to do. And you, Emily, are the person who called that out of me. And I I'm sure you remember I it's in ingrained in my memory forever, but it was the iHeart coaching graduation day two in London. It was the VIP day. And you offered a couple of us the opportunity to come up to the front of the room and get coached. 
And I remember just standing there and I don't remember if I actually cried or if the tears were just welling up and I was trying to keep them inside. But basically I just said, you know, I I just feel like a failure. (laughs) I feel like a failure because I've put all this work in. And at that point I had invested almost $50,000. It was like $48,000 and change into building the business. And I had made $2,150. And so you started really asking me these powerful questions, which is what a truly great coach does, which is rather than telling someone, you know, well, this is what you should do. You just started asking me questions. Well, who's your ideal client? You know, and I would, I would tell you, well, it's this woman who needs, you know, to feel comfortable in her body. And you, you kind of were like, is that really your ideal client? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, you know, no. And you said, do you, you know, do you feel energized working with these ladies? I was like, no, they drain me. And, you know, of course I would do my very best working with them. Um, you know, give them all my energy, but I would get off those calls and just feel like the life had been sucked out of me. And so then you started asking, well, who do you desire to work with? And, you know, I said, well, I'd love to work with people building businesses because every once in a while, one of my health coaching clients would, uh, would ask me, well, how did you build your blog? I want to get my health under control so I can blog like you do. And that felt very exciting. And so you started really asking me those questions, who do you want to work with? And it was very clear that I wanted to work with female business owners. And then came the kicker of the question, you know, why do you feel like you can't work with them? like now. (laughs) And I said, well, I haven't made 100K. And then you pointed out to me all the things I knew how to do in growing an online business. For example, I knew how to set up a Facebook ad. I knew how to create a landing page. I knew how to build a website. I knew how to write an email funnel. All these things I knew how to do. And you said, how much did you invest to learn how to do those things? And it was you know, almost 50,000. And you said, well, what if you offered someone a program to learn all those things and you just charge them, let's say $1,500 and you're going to teach them everything that it took you almost $50,000 to learn. Wouldn't that be such a massive value to them? And that's really where it clicked. Um, It just clicked. Oh my gosh, I don't have to have made six figures to offer this support. I'm going to be honest about it. I'm certainly not going to hold myself out as some six figure coach when I haven't done that yet. But I definitely have skills and support that I can offer to people, you know, that I wish had been available to me when I was first starting down that path. Oh, I love that so much. And I'm so excited hearing you share this story. And I do remember, remember it like it was yesterday. I can still see us standing up there in (laughs) front of the the whole room. Um, And I think this is such an important message that so many people need to hear because there are people who think they need the other certification, or they need to hit that financial milestone, or just reach some certain point before they're able to help people or impact the world. And what you're saying is we all have these gifts and we all have these skills that we can utilize. And from my perspective, we just need to be that step or two or five ahead of our ideal client. It's not like we need to be light years ahead of them. And I've actually heard people say many times, I love working with so-and-so because there are a few steps ahead of me. They're showing me what's possible. They're literally right there. And I can see that what they've done is something I can do as well. Yeah. And, you know, that's such a great point because honestly, I personally think it's much better and more effective to work with someone who is a few steps ahead of you rather than 15 or 20 steps ahead of you. You know, right now, if I were to go to a billion dollar business owner and ask them to coach me, I'm not sure that it would be as effective as someone who maybe is at the multiple seven figure level, because it's like they've got to a billion, it's probably going to be a a little bit tricky for them to remember back to when they were still going for their first million. But that person who's just, you know, made a seven figure business or created a multiple seven figure business, like they probably still remember what it was like to get from last year, we brought in um, a little over 500k in cash. And then we we did about 750k in sales. So for me, you know, someone who's at that seven figure mark or multiple seven figure mark, they still remember being a little bit over 500k and going for the seven figures. So I think they're much more able to help me than someone who's, you know, 10 steps ahead of me. 
Love it. So after London, tell us a little bit about what changed for you. Yeah. Well, one key thing, uh, additionally that you said at the front of the room, when we were there in London, that I want to make sure I give to your listeners was I had this feeling that I, I was not a success. And I think the words I used were, were I'm a failure. And you pointed out, you said, huh, that's so interesting. Um, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but you're like, because don't you own a home? And don't you have two law licenses? And didn't you fly around the world to be here? I'm not really seeing the connection between failure and all those things. <laughs> and it's like, a, a switch. yeah, and it's like a switch flipped in my head. Oh my goodness, I was hinging. I basically had defined success as being creates a six figure business and nothing else. If you hadn't created a six, created a six figure business would qualify as a success. And in that conversation with you, I decided I was going to change my definition of what a success was. And I was going to actually start believing that a success was just me being me. And, and how did that shift things for you, Anna? That's huge. It's, it's really probably the biggest, most important shift that I ever made. Because when you see yourself as a success, you project that energy and other people see you as you see yourself. If you believe that you're a failure, you're going to actually carry that energy and people will not have that confidence to invest and work with you. But if you believe it in your guts, in your core, that you're a success, you're going to carry that energy over with you. So true. And I know one of the other key shifts that you made was the belief around how much money you could make. And I'm so excited to hear the update on what your company did last year. And I'm just beaming with pride. <laughs> but the thing that I remember is I feel like 700 was one of the numbers we put up on the little board that we were working off of oh as God. one of your goals. Yes, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure that I did put 700. Um, and there was this like moment where like where you were questioning, can I do that? Does that make me greedy? And so we went through a whole process around really uncovering your true desires and also beliefs and fears around making a lot of money. So can you kind of speak to some of the shifts you had to make during that time as well to start to allow more abundance into your life? Yeah, well, it's believing that if I'm a person who's full of integrity and I have beautiful intentions for the funds that come into my life and the business, I think I should have as much money as possible because that's going to allow me to do as much good as possible. Like the more money I have, money is just a tool, it's a resource. And so if I have more money, I can give more money, I can bless more people. You know, as our team has grown, I'm able to pay more people um, and and give their families positive benefits and give their families income and revenue um, because we're making more money. I love it. Yeah. I remember writing on the board, the list of the things that you wanted to like, like what actually made up the 700 K or whatever it was. And a lot of it was, I wanted to donate to this charity. I want to give back mm -hmm. to the church. I want to do this and this. And it was all about other people. And then I think you said you wanted a new car or something, <laughs> but yeah. it was mostly about being charitable. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to that because, you know, I've given more money away in the last year slash two years, as our business, you know, really started making significant revenue than I ever gave away as a lawyer. And that's because, you know, it used to feel like a question of, well, I can give this money. And literally, Emily, there were months when I was practicing law when I would give a certain amount to the church and then I would put that amount on my credit card to pay for my groceries. Like I remember taking a jar of peanut butter and putting it back on the shelf because I just had this very strict grocery budget. And, you know, we were, I was $5 over. It's like, well, what can I live without? You know, as a lawyer, but I was a lawyer with a mortgage payment. And, you know, I, I, I never even broke 100K as an attorney working around the clock. So I, those questions don't happen anymore. Like I can give or I can eat. Right. That's huge. So take us back. So once you made that decision and you started to really focus on, you know, your desires and owning the fact that making more money would allow you the opportunity to give back and you got in alignment with your work, what started happening for you? 
Yeah. So I started believing that I was successful and believing that I could have a successful business and I could be of service and give value to people I wanted to give value to. And so I started offering business coaching. And then I did something that I I really encourage all my clients to do, which is look and, and say, okay, well, there are actually quite a number of business coaches and people have a lot of choices. So what's a way that I could stand out? And I started thinking through, you know, what do I enjoy doing? And I I really have fun with it that I'm also great at or have the capacity to become really masterful at that the marketplace will also pay for, like pay cold, hard cash for. And the thing that I hit, hit on under the umbrella of business coaching was copywriting. And uh, I've been writing since I was Oh my goodness. I was writing stories and poems when I was six, seven, eight years old. I wrote a rap, a Bible rap when I was nine or 10 that I now use in my keynote. (laughs) And um, I was an English major. And then as I said earlier, you know, as an attorney, most of what I did was research and writing. So I knew I was an excellent writer. Now, you know, brief writing is different than copywriting, but copywriting is a skill. And if, you know, I knew that I was willing to put the time in and to continue investing in uploading leveling my skills and working with the best copywriters I could get access to. And so I really threw myself into mastering that niche and started um, really making key connections with people who would be able to provide me with referrals and actually made some key connections by being in your group, you know, with people who uh, were, let's say, a web designer who, you know, people would come to them with website projects, but the copy would be bad. And they're like, well, I could build on this website, but they're not going to get many sales with that copy. So I started having... Um, some opportunities there to get folded into other people's packages. So for example, someone might hire this web designer and they would, um, they would pay, you know, for a package that included me writing their website. And then I just did that, you know, a couple times and people were so pleased. They started telling their friends and their friends told their friends and truly the copywriting just took off by referrals And that's what took us to our first six figures. It was primarily um, doing doing copywriting. And then Emily, when you and I started working together privately, was when I actually looked at my business and I started seeing where the business was coming from and seeing, hmm, this is amazing and I'm so grateful, but a lot of this is coming in from referrals from other people. And I had a few main sources of referral and I thought, if these ever dried up for some reason or another, I, I'd be kind of in a bad position. So I really had a passion. All right, I'm going to really move, start to move away from all this done for you copywriting. And truly now I've written for you know 65 different business owners. And I was doing a lot of coaching when I would work with people on their copy. There was a lot of coaching involved. I've been in a lot. I've been involved in a lot of really successful launches um, as a copywriter. So I had seen behind the scenes, you know, in a lot of really successful businesses. So I started. Uh, we started working together privately, and you helped me build up that capacity to get bring in my own coaching clients. And, uh, and that was another huge milestone for me was to start little by little replacing that copywriting income with coaching income to the point that uh, last year of the 500k plus, you know, that we brought in, I believe, um, I have to check my records to be sure, but I think it was somewhere around 15% of that was done for you copywriting. Wow. That's a huge shift. Yeah. Whereas it used to be, you know, that first 100K, it was probably 85%. Um, And that's what I really, you know, want people to be encouraged. Like just because you start out, you know, doing one thing doesn't mean that you can't shift and grow and move closer and closer and closer to where you really want to be. And my heart really is. Um, you know, in the coaching and the teaching, I still love the copy and I still have a few done for you copywriting clients. Um, but copy takes a ton of energy. And so now I'm able to really be super selective with the copy projects that I take on and make sure that I'm not, you know, overloading my own uh, capacity to really bring my fullest energy to each of those projects. Amazing. And I really want to dial this in for people. So it's only been a few years and you've literally pivoted and five times your business. Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. 
<laughs> so can you take us back a little bit more to, to the details of that? So you obviously made a decision. I know when we worked together, it was really on your heart to pivot and open up these new services and, and copy. Like you said, it's very time intensive. It's very trading time for, um, you know, those hours for money. And so there was a very big intention on your part in terms of bringing on different types of clients. And so how did that actually happen for anyone who's out there and they're like, oh, I want to pivot or I want to start offering something different, but how do I go from working as a copywriter to a business coach or something similar? Yeah, well, there's shifts that you can make within what you're currently doing. So for example, as a copywriter, I used to sell hours bundles. And um, one of my copywriting mentors is Ray Edwards, who was written for Tony Robbins and some super high level people. And I remember telling Ray, Ray, I'm really tired of, of trading, you know, doing these hours bundles. Like, how can I, um, how can I get out of this doing it this way? And he was like, don't charge for hours bundles. <laughs> Imagine uh, that. I was really expecting something, you know, more uh, complex. He said, no, just like quit doing that. <laughs> like, stop it. <laughs> stop it. And Love so it. I think that, you know, I felt like I had to do it that way because as an attorney, we build in six minute increments. So for the first, you know, uh, I practiced for eight years. I started my business five years into my law career and then I did them both for the next three years before I fully, uh, fully transitioned out of law practice. And, you know, I just got used to billing my time. And, and that was a huge thing, you know, outside of even like pivoting my niche was just working within my current niche in a different way. So I started really, um, charging flat fees for projects and just making sure that my agreements were super clear. Like you have to get me everything within 90 days. And, um, you know, this is your project window. And once we hit this window, like it's done, you can have one revision. A revision is not the same as a rewrite. So really making sure that I was doing, um, you know, working in a way that made sense to protect my energy in the niche that I was in. But then in adding in the coaching packages, um, you know, you and I worked together to develop a strategy on that. But something I started doing was just showing up more. I mean, imagine that, but actually going live on my business page and teaching things in a formulaic and systematic manner. And then opening up discovery calls. Imagine that. And I find this so often, even today, you know, sometimes a client will come and say, well, nobody bought my stuff. And you say, okay, well, how many times did you tell people about your stuff? And they're like, well, I sent out two emails. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you sent out two emails. You know, people need so many impressions to be able to even consider buying and trusting you with their with their hard earned money. And you're only going to send out two emails and then tell me that people aren't buying your stuff. No, go send out like 20 more and then we can talk. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's one of the key points you're making here is sometimes we're making it harder than it needs to be. Like there's some really simple things that we know will work, like showing up, actually making sure your company is set up to receive business, actually having a buy now link there, sending out emails, getting visible, letting people know that you exist. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes we make it far too complicated. Yes. And making sure that people know what you have to offer. So it's like, okay, yes, go live on your business page, but also talk about what you have to offer. It doesn't mean that every time you go live has to be this big pitch or this big, I'd much prefer the word invitation to pitch. But you know, if you're going to train for 10, 12 minutes, then the last minute of your life can absolutely be, hey, if you found this valuable and you want to talk about going deeper with some private work, uh, go to sarahannapowers.com forward slash whatever your link is and um, and fill out the application. We can have a quick chat about your goals and see if there's any way that we might work together. I mean, super simple. Exactly. Yeah. And I know one of the things that was coming up for you when we worked privately together was this decision to resign as a lawyer and oh, to move full time in your business. <laughs> It was a big one. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that period of time and how you made that decision? Yes. So I love, Emily, the way that you helped me frame my law job as my biggest investor in my business. And I love how you teach your clients to um, that it's super smart 
to have an income source that's at least covering your bare minimum living expenses, because that way your business doesn't have all this pressure on it when you're just getting it off the ground. Um, so for me, that was a wonderful strategy to uh, to actually keep practicing law while I was building my business because that way I didn't have that extra concern about like I have to bring on a client or else I don't I don't have money to eat. <laughs> you know that's a bad right thing. to get that peanut butter. Yes, to get that peanut butter. <laughs> Um, so I was very blessed in that, um, but also very intentional. So I, when we first started working together, Emily, I was with a, a very big firm. It's like Fortune 100 best places to work multiple years in a row, um, what you would call a big law firm. There wasn't a lot of flexibility there. They were uh, on board with me having a side business. That was a whole thing. I had to go through, like, get the board's permission to even be able to form an LLC. So that was a whole thing. Um, and I do encourage, you know, if you are going to keep your employment, like go through the proper channels because you don't want to feel like you're being sneaky or like hiding the fact that you have another business, like set it up properly. Um, but even though they were okay with me having that on the side, I just didn't have any much time. I had some time, but I didn't have a lot of time. So at some point, in fact, this was early in 2016, um, I shifted to work with a small family owned firm. And I made, I was making less money. So my, my legal salary continued to decrease. Uh, but I was very upfront about having a side business. Um, they were, they fully were fully aware of that, even supportive of it, like would actually say, Oh, you know, well, Anna can come speak on that. She's great at emails or, or what have you. And, um, and in exchange for the decreased pay, I got more of my time back. And so that was the first thing that I did was I, I found a law job that was more conducive to allowing me to build my business on the side. And then at some point when we had made, when we started making 10K months, I actually went to my law partner and said, you know, my business is doing pretty well. I'd love to uh, talk about decreasing my hours. And in exchange for that, you know, I totally would understand if we need to decrease my pay. And Emily, um, he said, you know what, let's just decrease your hours and keep your pay the same because you're doing a great job for us. And I, said, I remember that. That was such an incredible day. <laughs> I said, okay. And I'm a spiritual person. I love Jesus. And to me, that's just, you know, that's just a, a God, I call them God nods. That's just a, a, a sign of, you know, I'm protected, I'm provided for. And so I, so that step happened. That was probably, mm, somewhere around the middle of 2017. And then in 2018, I did get, you know, it just, the business continued to grow. I think we had had like a 17K month, 13K month, every month was above 10K. And um, at the time my law practice, I think I was bringing home a little less than 5K a month. So my business by this point is, you know, double um, what my law salary was. And so I went back to the partner and just said, Hey, I really do need to go part-time. And so in 2018, I went part-time law. So three days a week, I'd be in the law office. Two days a week, I'd be in my business. And then we started hitting and, and passing 20K months. And so um, I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm making at this point, I think I was taking home $3,000 a month to work three days a week in the law office. And then my business was making, you know, 22, 24K a month. So it just started to kind of get to that point where it's like, all right, Anna, what are you doing? You know, you're making seven times in your business what you're what you're making at law. But the the kicker for me was I actually called a friend of mine. This was the end of April or maybe mid April of 2018. I called a friend of mine who used to be a Wall Street attorney who now is a very well known ghostwriter. And we were in a mastermind together and I just, you know, I just just called him as a friend to say, you know, I feel like it might be time for me to leave, but I'm nervous about the money because even though it was just 3K to take home a month, like that covered my mortgage, that covered most of my food and my utilities, you know, that covered kind of like that, the minimum living that I needed. And so it was really still very scary for me to give that up. And, um, and in that conversation, he said, you know what, I've got all these book projects and I could really use some support and have been praying that someone would show up. You know, I've been praying for support with this writing. Would you maybe be interested in writing with me? And I can basically, uh, I can hire you on for four months and I can, he actually offered me more than I was making 
for my three day a week law job. Um, and he was only asking me to write for him two days a week. And so I said, uh, whoa, I didn't expect that. When would you need me to start? And he said, um, yesterday would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you know what? All right, pray for me. I'm going to go and give my resignation. And that was a miracle in itself because usually, you know, my law partner was super busy, traveled a lot. It's very rare that you could ask for a meeting and get it on the same day that you asked for it. But, you know, I just said, all right, God, if this is what you have for me, like, let me be able to meet with my partner. Let this like put your hand on this conversation because I was so grateful for the opportunity they gave me. I didn't want to come across like, you know, like I was uh, in any way ungrateful for for the work that I've been able to do there for all those years. And um, and I got a meeting with him that afternoon. I told him what was going on. And he said he totally understood we both cried. We hugged. I mean, it was just the most beautiful conversation. And, you know, I gave my two weeks and that was it. Never looked back. Wow. What an incredible story. And I love, I just want to highlight for all the listeners, I love all of the points where, like you said, they were God nods. And it was these these doors opening when you had the strength and had the courage to realize what it was that you actually wanted. Mm -hmm. And you started to get real about what was possible for you and your company. And it was just sign after sign that you were headed in the right direction. Yeah. And I'll say one more thing about that because it's kind of like, um, the longer I stayed at law as the business was really progressing, it's like tasks that used to feel really easy, um, started to get really challenging legal tasks. So I'd sit down to write discovery responses, which are, it's a very basic first year attorney task. And it's like my brain would struggle to do it. And, you know, I do believe that we will get signs and indicators of when it's time to move on. And it almost felt like God was just kind of like, okay, like this isn't where you're meant to be anymore. And even beyond that, I started breaking out in hives like that spring of 2018. I developed this like hive like rash that even like the dermatologists were like, we're not really even sure, but here's some, you know, cream for it. <laughs> and I remember having that conversation with my law partner. I was like, like, look, like my body, like literally can't even tolerate this anymore. <laughs> not that there was anything wrong with, you know, the work that I was doing or his firm. It was just, I think my physical body was even telling me it is time to move to a new place. Oh, definitely. I mean, I've heard that so many times on this show from various people where their body is literally giving them signs or mm -hmm. creating disease because they're not in alignment anymore and not in the right place. And I totally believe in that. So Anna, so since then you resigned from the job and you moved into business coaching. I know you've hosted events. I know you've had masterminds of your own. You've launched programs. So tell us what has been the most fulfilling thing you've done over the past few years? Oh my gosh. It would be really hard to choose like a program or, you know, an event. Um, but I'll say the most fulfilling thing I've done is just get closer and closer to being the full me, the real me that God created me to be. And that may sound like a bit of a like <laughs> amorphous answer, but truly it's just following those um following those breadcrumbs of when something does feel aligned, do more of that. When something lights you up, do more of that. When something, you know, sparks your spirit, do more of that. And that's the most fulfilling uh the, ful the most fulfilling experience I've had. And many people have asked me, what's your favorite part of running your business? And I always say, it's just that I feel more like me than I remember feeling since I was seven, eight years old. And it sounds like you finally given yourself permission as well in many areas. And I think one of the things I observed from you was also not making certain things wrong, because I think for a while you felt guilty about having spent 50K and only made 2,150 and you felt guilty investing more money. And is that the right decision? And so what I've observed from you is more of a confidence around the way that you feel like what you're being called to do, the decisions that you're making. Would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. And for me, that's spiritual growth as well. You know, before you and I worked together one-on-one, -on -one, I prayed, I asked 
I asked God for direction. I actually asked him for an image and, um, you know, an indicator of how he felt about me making the decision to work with you. And he just was so faithful to give me confirmation so that if things ever got hard, I just draw back on that confirmation. And I know that, um, I know that I'm not going to be led in a direction that's going to harm me. Definitely. And I know that was a big decision for you. I can't remember the exact amount. Was it like a $40,000 investment? Yes, is $40,000. And at the <laughs> point, I believe my business had brought in total about 65k. And because I had put all that money into it when I wasn't making money, it was like I was finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel for like paying down all the credit cards. But I also knew if those referrals dry, dried up at that point, I didn't have a solid system for bringing in my own clients and my own leads. And, you know, I remember praying so hard because I really wanted to work with you privately, but I wanted to do it the next year. And so when that opportunity came open and it was like, you know, seven, eight months too soon in my mind, I thought, oh no, <laughs> this can't happen yet. <laughs> I'm supposed to like clear up all the, everything I owe. And then, you know, and then we're going to, you know, be able to have this conversation. But I really felt like, you know, God isn't going to put this in my path right now. Like his timing is perfect. And that's why I prayed so hard over the decision. And um, can I just share like the image that he gave me? Please. So, um, so I just asked him and trust me, I thought it was super weird too to pray for an image, but I was at a conference with Ray Edwards and he brought these people from Bethel church and they said, here, just ask God to give you an image of how he feels about you as you're making this decision. Cause I, you know, they, ha they were available for prayer. And I was like, listen, I'm about to make a 40 K investment decision. I need some prayer. And <laughs> I remember when she told me to ask for an image, I, I was like, that is super weird. But, and she said, well, you did come over here and kind of ask me for help. I said, okay, fair point. I will ask for an image. And so I said, Jesus, how do you feel about me making this decision? Because my big fear was that I was going to make the wrong decision and that I was almost out of this like hole of all this money I had invested that I've been paying back, paying back, paying back. I was almost at the end of it. And now I'm about to like put 40 K more on credit cards, you know? So how could that, I mean, everybody in my life would have told me that's so wrong. That's just wrong to do. It's not smart. It's not wise, but yet I felt this call to it. And so I needed to know from God, how do you feel about me making this decision? Can you just give me an image? And he flashed me back to this memory from when I was about five years old. And my best friend, Allison, and I had a bag of dumb, dumb suckers. <laughs> and my mom said, you can each choose one sucker. So we chose our suckers and she unwrapped hers and it was beautiful and perfect and shiny. And I unwrapped mine and it was sunken and concave and deformed. And I remember that moment looking at my like, sad sucker and just being so disappointed and thinking I chose wrong. And I looked at Allison and I said, I don't like mine. Can I have yours? And she goes, sure. And she traded me for it immediately. And that is the image God showed me when I said, when I asked him, how do you feel about me making this decision? And when I got that image and that memory, I just started crying because the message to me was, you cannot screw this up. You cannot make the wrong decision. This is an option I'm putting in front of you. And if it's a bad sucker that you pick out, I will trade you a perfect sucker for it. Like you're going to be fine. And um, yeah. And I was like, all right, I'm doing it, doing it. Wow. I've never heard that story and I have goosebumps. That is so beautiful. I Thank cannot you for believe, sharing that. I cannot believe that I haven't <laughs> shared that with you. And I, I did ask a few more questions. And one other question that I asked Emily, because you know, this may resonate with some people too. There was a little bit of me that, you know, I mean, you have a level of internet fame. <laughs> and there was a little bit of me that was like, okay, God, am I doing this work? Um because 
this is the right person for me? Or is this an ego thing for me? Like Emily is going to work with me privately. And like, that's going to make me feel like I'm, you know, super special. I don't want to do it for ego reasons. I want to do it because she is truly the person I'm meant to work with. So I literally asked God, I said, Lord, show me an image of what you, how you feel about me working with Emily and I, your name specifically. And I saw this image of this beautiful field with like bright sunshine, just flowers like flowing in the breeze. And I was like, all right, signed. Wow. That's such an important uh, point that you bring up because I think it's so, you know, whether it's God or, or what, you know, the universe, whatever people believe in intuition, we can ask for guidance and ask for that direction and just trust, like you said, that we're um, going to be guided on the right path. And it's not always, you know, that we just have to rely on ourselves. Sometimes even having a conversation yeah. with someone who you trust um, can bring about, about that clarity. And I just love how you've illustrated that, Anna. Thank you so much. Mm, my pleasure. Such a joy to share. <laughs> And so in terms of our work together, I just want to ask a few more questions yeah. because like you said, a lot of what you've shared has been in service to other people who maybe want to join the I Heart My Life community or they're thinking about working with other coaches. So once you made that investment, how did that shift things for you financially? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, that was a huge commitment and that was my moment of I believe in this vision God's given me and I believe that he is leading me down this path and I'm like putting all the chips in. So, I mean, it was a big risk. It was a calculated risk. I did, you know, I did kind of did the math on it and, you know, I did my worst case. Like, what if this didn't work? Because, you know, as a coach, this is something I've had to really learn. We're not responsible for our clients' results. You can show up and give everything you have, but your client actually has to implement. <laughs> you can't control that. Just like um, my personal trainer can't like pick up the weight and do the bicep curl for me. Like I have, he, I can, wish. he can show me the perfect form, but I have to actually do it, you know? Yep. So, um, so I knew there's a chance like, okay, well, if this didn't work, you know, would I still be able to make my house payment? Yes. And basically I figured out, I would still be able to eat. I would be able to pay for my house. It would just take me like 15 years to pay off these credit cards. And that was a risk that I was willing to take. But obviously, that's a big commitment. So how that shifted my energy in the way that I showed up is I, I did everything you told me to do instead of just letting it kind of go in one ear, which frankly, even if you had offered me, you know, a $5,000 program at that time, which is a significant amount of money as well, but it's all relative. So if we had been doing that same coaching for 5000 and you told me to do some of the things you recommended that I do, I wouldn't have done them because it's like mm, they were inconvenient or uncomfortable. For example, building my magnetic messaging program, building my signature program while I was still practicing law, while I had like six copywriting clients and like 12 coaching clients was not a walk in the park. But it was something that, you know, as we're working together, it's like, wow, I don't have anything leveraged. I need something leveraged. It's time to build that. And there was never going to be a perfect time to do it. But because I had made that big investment in our work, I actually listened, you know, when you said, yeah, it is time. And this is the time to, you know, just know the next six, eight weeks are going to be like really tight, but then you're going to have this asset. And that, like that program has been the foundation of all of our programs that have led up to our, you know, 500k plus annually business. I love that. Yeah, it's that commitment level. Just like when you do hire a trainer, if you pay them, you're going to be much more likely to show up and actually do the work and commit to the goals that you're setting. And I think it's really important that we also highlight the fact that throughout our conversation, you've illustrated that you make decisions based on where you want to be. Yeah. And so you wanted to have a leveraged program. You're not just making decisions based on this current moment where Anna Powers and her company are right now. It's yeah. like, no, where do I want to be? in a few months or a few years? Where do I want to take my company? And then you backtrack and ask yourself, okay, great. So what do I need to do now in order to get there? That's so important because if you're just always, you know, planning in the moment, you're really being reactive. 
Um, and you know, my goal for myself and for my clients is I want us to be able to be responsive, not reactive. So we're super firm and strong in our plans and confident in, you know, the direction that we're heading. And yes, we can respond if something, you know, unexpected occurs, but we're not reacting to it. It's a different energy. Exactly. Love it. So Anna, I'd love to know what's next for you. What are you most excited about? Oh my goodness. You know, I am, so I'm not sure when this is, uh, when this is going to air, but as we're recording, we're in quarantine (laughs) and, um, I am learning so many lessons in this season. And the biggest lesson I have gotten in this season is that, um, many of the things you thought you had to do, you don't actually have to do. And so what I'm actually really looking forward to is, um, taking all these beautiful lessons that I'm learning And really um, not just going back to the same old, same old normal um, whenever we are able to, you know, freely circulate again, really actually keeping more space for creativity, more white space um, for uh, just for peace and relaxation. And I think that, you know, this time has given me and a lot of us a, a chance to pause and really reflect on the things that are most important to us. So that's what I'm just looking forward to as I design my programs for 2021, really checking them with what is going to be most aligned with who I'm created to be, because that's how I'm going to be most valuable to everyone around me. Beautiful. So is one of the things you've realized you don't have to do is you don't have to jam pack your calendar full of tasks and to do's. Yes. Isn't that crazy? I mean, yes. I know all my coaches have been trying to teach me that for years. (laughs) Um, It took coronavirus. Yeah, it pretty much did. I mean, it's just remarkable. Last year, I think I had 17 or 18 trips and I love events and I'm a people person. Like I'm an extrovert. I really, really do. And I think I mentioned this at the top of the episode, like I enjoy getting to know people. Um, but I thought I had to do all those trips because I have to keep like meeting people in person because when they feel my energy in person, you know, they want to work with me, et cetera. And what, and now we're literally not allowed to go meet people in person and my business hasn't missed a beat. So I'm like, huh, that's so interesting. All those trips I thought I had to do, I don't actually have to do them. I'm hearing the same thing from so many people. It's that time and space and realizing what's actually moving the needle for them. And life is like done it for them. They are able to relinquish some control, relinquish some events, things that were in their calendar calendar that are no longer um, even allowed, but they're not feeling like they're, they have a problem with that. They're actually happy. So I totally get it. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, again, I wouldn't have wished it to unfold in this way because certainly people getting sick and dying, you know, that's certainly not what any of us would wish. And I do believe that no matter what, you know, we're going through, there's always a lesson for us. And um, ultimately, things are always unfolding for our highest good. And so, you know, we can choose to see the lesson and actually come out, you know, stronger and um, more aligned on the other side of it. Beautiful. So Anna, I don't believe in regrets, but I do believe in looking back as a way to um, help us prepare for the future. So I'm curious to know, is there anything you would have said to that girl who was in her first year working at that law firm? What would you have said to her when she was feeling uncomfortable, feeling like this wasn't the right fit? Would you have guided her in a different direction or taught her anything else? Yeah, I mean... That the interesting thing is, um, before I ever said yes to that job, I remember because I was a, uh, I was valedictorian in my high school. I had a four O with a double major in college, but in law school, it's just a different kind of, um, different kind of grading system. You're graded on a curve. So I ended up with like a 3.18 average or something. I was just below honors. And before I accepted that job, I remember one of the partners messaged me and said, well, we don't even usually look at people who aren't in the top 10% of their law class, but maybe you could send me all your transcripts and that could make up for your deficiency. And I remember when I read that email and the word deficiency, no one in my whole life has ever called me deficient in anything. 
And, you know, looking back in it, it's like I knew in my gut right then before I ever accepted that job, that was not a place with the energy that was meant for me. Now, again, I believe everything unfolded for my highest good. But I'm, I've become, as the business has grown, more and more aware of paying attention to those like initial gut cues. Um, and by the way, I did run into that partner like years later and actually told him, you know, that story. And I was like, you know, I shouldn't have taken that job when you called me deficient. <laughs> oh, wow. What did he say? Um, he was like, can you find that email? I don't remember saying that. I was like, that was like eight years ago. <laughs> I don't know. It was like five years after whenever he said it was, I was like, no, I don't still have that email. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. He denied saying it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Uh, but, um, and, and honestly, it, it just, I don't know. I'm not like, I wasn't saying it to be mean to him. It was just, that was like, that was like my moment of, you know, just like, you know what, you said this thing to me and it was not true. And that's just something to be aware of. Like maybe don't call people deficient in the future. <laughs> yeah. And like you're saying, learning to check in with what your gut is telling you and the direction you're yeah. being called to go in and not being so scared or tentative when it comes to pivoting. Yeah. Well, and because for me, you know, a, a huge reason that I took that first job was it was a down economy and this is a job making, I think I made 93,000 my first year. So like you're lucky to have this job, just take it and kind of overlook the fact that one of your very first correspondences with them was, you know, one of the main key partners saying you're deficient. You know, I mean, nobody should honestly, like none of us, I, I believe, should should be in an environment where that's, you know, what what people feel of us before we even start the job you know, but it was, so I've really learned to check in with, you know, if you have that feeling on the front end, it's just not a fit and that's okay. Like not everything is a fit for everybody. That doesn't mean that that wasn't a good firm, that there weren't, you know, wonderful, amazing people there, that there wasn't wonderful work being done there. It just wasn't, you know, it wasn't probably the best place for me to have been. (laughs) Totally. Thank you for sharing that. And final question. What is one way that you can encourage our listeners to create a life better than their dreams? Mm, Yeah. So this is probably going to feel a little strange for me to say, because I know we've, we've gone to a lot of places in this interview, but what I would say is be consistent, like just show up and keep on going toward the things that you feel called to. Um, You know, Emily, you talk a lot about not being a dabbler. I really think that advice is so beautiful. Like the things that you feel called to own it, allow yourself to feel that call and allow yourself to take those steps. And I don't, you know, I don't think it even really matters that much if it's, you know, a six inch step or a six foot step. And I think there are seasons in life where like the best step that we can take is like six inches. Like that's kind of all we can muster. And then there are seasons when we can take those six foot leaps. Um, But as long as you're continuing to move forward, whether it's a small step or a big leap, like just continue to move forward in the direction that you feel called. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that illustration. Just keep moving forward. Dabblers don't get results. (laughs) It's very true. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm so grateful that you shared your story so openly. And I know the listeners got so much out of it. Um, I really am just so blessed to have you as a part of my life and to have had a firsthand experience with your journey and to see it in real life unfold. You have so, so much to be proud of. And I truly know that this is just the start for you. Thank you so much, Emily. And you are truly one of the most influential people, um, you know, in my business's trajectory and in my life. And I'm so, so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with you and to still be connected with you. And um, I'm just so grateful to have come on the show and shared and just want to reiterate to your listeners that, you know, you are someone who truly cares and um, you made such a huge impact in my life. And I know you're continuing to do that with, um, with so many people who have the privilege of working with you. Thank you. And where can everyone find you online, Anna? Yeah. So you can check out my website at sarahannapowers.com. There is no H on that Sarah. So it's S-A-R-A-A-N-N-A 
P-O-W-E-R-S.com. And also I am connecting more and more with people on Instagram. So you can follow me there. Same handle at Sarah Anna Powers. And I do a lot of DMing and stories. And then the the last place would be, uh, we have a podcast as well. It's called Faith Forward Online Business. And so you're welcome to take a listen to that. And I look forward to connecting with you. Amazing. Thanks, Anna. I hope you loved today's episode. I was so excited to have that time with Anna and it just made me smile thinking about how far she's come on her journey. And the same is possible for you. If you're curious to know more about iHeart Coaching, go to iHeartCoaching.com today and sign up for our incredible A to Z How to Build Your Coaching Business program that's available for you right now. Thank you for listening to the I Heart My Life show. For more inspiration, success tips, and ways to achieve your life and business goals, definitely follow me on Facebook and Instagram on I Heart My Life Now. See you next time.